Daylight Series by John Bukovalos. Book Four, Intermediate, Part One. Unit One, Step One. A not very serious look at the history of life. Bubble talk. Millions of years ago, life began in the sea, in the form of bubble-like creatures who all looked the same. Many of them found life so boring that they decided to try something else. The ones with no courage or imagination stayed in the sea, warm, comfortable, and safe. The braver ones left the sea for the land and became the first tourists. The greedy ones ate everything they found and grew bigger and bigger. The really adventurous ones turned into monsters, grew tails and horns, and began to terrify all the smaller creatures. With no one to control them, they turned into terrible lizards, dinosaurs, and conquered the planet Earth. Then, out of nowhere, a huge comet crashed into the Earth. Dust. Covered the planet. It was so thick that it blocked out the light from the sun. Dinosaurs could not survive. Smaller life forms, encouraged by this heavenly gift, quickly ate the eggs the dinosaurs had left, and then went and hid under water and in caves. They grew different parts which were useful for the separate ways they lived. Some silly creatures grew unnecessary parts, which were so strange. That all the other animals laughed at them. Those funny-looking creatures soon disappeared. Unit one, step two. The food of love. Some creatures climbed up trees and ate fruit and leaves, which helped their minds grow. They then began to communicate. The first thing they thought of was food. Or was it love? Some very strange creatures found other ways of communicating, and drew what they were thinking. Men liked ladies so much that they wanted to be with them all the time, so they dragged them into caves. Great inventions. Somehow, men's brains got so big that they started to invent things. They discovered iron and made weapons to fight and hunt with. They also learned how to protect their women. As time passed, females' minds grew bigger than males. When women realized that men wanted them, they became more demanding and insisted on going out with their men. After a struggle which lasted thousands of years, women finally made it to parties and danced and drank with men. Over the centuries, man has become so advanced that we now have beautiful cities. Sophisticated entertainment and fine food. Unit one, step three. Teenage Advice Bureau. A panel of experts answer teenagers' problems. Shy. Dear T A B, I'm an extremely shy person. Whenever I meet new people. I blush immediately and become too embarrassed to say anything intelligent or humorous. I haven't got any friends at school because I'm too scared to say anything more than hello. Even my teachers ignore me in class because they don't think I'm intelligent enough to answer their questions. This is making me feel very lonely. I never get invited to any parties, and people never phone me at home. My mum says horrible things to me. Like nobody likes me because I'm not nice enough to have good friends. What's wrong with me? S T lonely. Dear lonely, there's nothing wrong with you, except you lack self-confidence, which is not surprising, seeing what your mother says to you. She is old enough to know better. As for your schoolmates, give them a chance. It's possible they think you are too unfriendly to join in their conversations. Try to speak to one or two of them first, and don't worry what they'll think of you. 
Be friendly and ask them if they'd like to go to the cinema. This is an ideal place because you don't have to talk too much and there's always the film to discuss afterwards. Friendship is a two-way thing. People have to know you want to be friends before they make an effort. T.A.B. Unit 1, Step 4. Encyclopedia Corner. The Fight for Survival. Since 1600, man has been responsible for the extinction of at least 50 species of mammals and over a hundred species of birds. In the past, the main reason for their extinction was hunting for food, or fun, by so-called sportsmen. Nowadays, in most countries all over the world, laws protect animals and wildlife. Even so, by the turn of the century, over one million species will be extinct. This is not only because of overhunting, overfishing and trade in wildlife, but also because of pollution and man's destruction of the natural environment to build farms, roads and factories. Time is running out for many of the animals and plants with which we share our planet. Either we do something now, or all the animal and plant world will be in danger. Please help WWF to fight against the destruction of species. Remember that neither animals nor plants can speak for themselves. It is up to us, both individuals and organizations, to speak and act for them. By supporting WWF, you fight not only for the survival of all species, but also against the pollution and destruction of the planet. Together, we can make a difference. Unit 1. Listening Comprehension. The Perfect House. You will hear a wife talking to her husband about a house she has just seen. Listen carefully and tick the box with the house that matches her description. You will hear the conversation twice. Hello, Henry. Is that you? Hello, dear. Have you found a house? Darling, I've found the perfect house for us. You'll love it. It sits on a hill and has a view of the most beautiful lake. The lake is in the middle of a big forest. The house has got two floors with a balcony back and front. There's a garden with lots of pretty flowers and a lovely stone wall around it. There's also a one-car, no, no, a two-car garage. But the sheep, Henry... Sheep? In the garage? No, the sheep from the farm at the lake. And the lake, Henry, it's so romantic and so quiet. There's no one around, only a few boats on the lake. Yes, dear, but how much does the house cost? Cost? Oh, I forgot to ask. Now you will hear the conversation again. Hello, Henry. Is that you? Hello, dear. Have you found a house? Darling, I've found the perfect house for us. You'll love it. It sits on a hill and has a view of the most beautiful lake. The lake is in the middle of a big forest. The house has got two floors with a balcony back and front. There's a garden with lots of pretty flowers and a lovely stone wall around it. There's also a one-car, no, no, a two-car garage, but the sheep, Henry. Sheep? In the garage? No, the sheep from the farm at the lake. And the lake, Henry, it's so romantic and so quiet. There's no one around, only a few boats on the lake. Yes, dear, but how much does the house cost? Cost? Oh, I forgot to ask. Unit 2, Step 1. Getting Married. Customs and Superstitions. To be, or not to be, married. That is the question. When a young couple decides to get married, the wedding is not always a ceremony involving a church, a priest, a well-dressed bride, a crying mother, and a group of hungry guests. Each country has its own customs, and superstitions, some of which are very strange indeed. Fire! A bride in Morocco must be prepared for a very noisy wedding. Guns are fired around her before, during and after the ceremony, and in the bridal bedroom itself. 
It is thought that the smoke from the gun makes the bride clean, while the noise frightens away evil spirits. Jump the broom. At gypsy weddings, the bride and groom have to jump over a broomstick. If the bride's dress touches a stick, she will not make a good wife. If the groom touches it, he will not be faithful to her. Tiwi marriages. Tiwi women on the island of Melville, off Australia, cannot choose their own husbands. It is done for them before they are even born during their parents' wedding. Tree marriages. In northern India, evil spirits are believed to attack a bride who marries a widower. So, a widower who is marrying for the second or third time should first marry a tree which is dressed as a bride. In this way, the jealous spirits of his dead wife or wives attack the tree instead of his new wife. The man may feel a little silly, but isn't it time for him to put down roots? Unit 2, Step 2 Getting married? No kidding? Are you thinking of getting married? So soon, so young. Before you make your final decision, bear in mind. On your wedding day, you can't chew gum or blow bubbles. You mustn't wear a bathing suit, torn jeans or odd socks. You must remember your new wife's name. You mustn't eat garlic for breakfast. You mustn't tell dirty jokes to the vicar. Even if you're very young, you shouldn't wear a false moustache. It might come off on the bride when you kiss her. In Michigan, USA, the law says that married couples must live together. If they don't, they may end up in jail. Michigan law also says that a man owns his wife's clothes. If she leaves her husband, he can follow her down the street and remove every article of her clothing. In Tennessee, a husband can't kick his wife out of bed even if her feet are cold. A wife, however, can kick her husband out of bed any time without giving him a reason. In Tibet, remember to stick your tongue out at your future wife or husband. It's a sign of welcome. In Greece, the priest gives a couple honey and wine after the ceremony. The honey is to make their life together sweet. What is the wine for? Unit 2, Step 3 Teenage Advice Bureau Overweight with spots Dear TAB, I am almost 16 years old and would like some advice. I am extremely overweight, which is not really a problem for me, but it seems to worry other people. I'm getting really fed up with it because I don't think I overeat. However, the real problem is that lately I have developed spots all over my face. I used to have really nice clear skin, but now it's awful. My face looks like the moon. I read somewhere that spots are caused by eating too much chocolate. Is this true? I'm so upset that I don't eat chocolate now. MC Pleasantly Plump Dear Pleasantly Plump, Spots are hardly caused by eating chocolate, so it's nothing to worry about. Anyway, nobody has ever died of acne. The latest research proves that acne is caused by hormones. Nearly everybody gets acne in their adolescent years, but nobody has to put up with it. There are a number of treatments for it. Ask at your chemists. As for your weight, it can be highly annoying when people comment on your size all the time, but you should ignore them. However, are you sure that you do not eat too much and that you get enough exercise? No one is asking you to look like a model, but if you can lose some weight, do. You'll feel healthier and live longer. T.A.B. Unit 2, Step 4, Encyclopedia Corner. 
the crystalline purity of Greek waters. The gods could have chosen an island anywhere in the world. They chose Crete, and there they made a paradise for themselves. Crete, more than any other Greek island, has kept its history, its treasures, and its beauty. The more you get to know the island, the more you'll appreciate the god's choice. Lose yourself in time in Knossos, the palace where Theseus found himself face to face with the Minotaur. Taste the simple life of a shepherd in the remote, peaceful mountains. Look down on the island's crystal clear waters, waters which reflect the beauty of many mythical heroes, warm waters which reflect the hospitality of the people of Crete. Hospitality that is as old as time itself. The longer you stay on Crete, the more you'll see the wonder of the past and the magic of the present harmonize. Crete, where the experience of a lifetime awaits you, where, in the playground of the gods, you can find time to live, think, play, or simply dream. Unit 2 Listening Comprehension Spies. You will hear a conversation between two spies. Listen carefully and tick whether the statements are true or false. You will hear the piece twice. Now, number five, let's talk about your trip once more. Your flight takes off at 10 a.m. and you arrive at 4 p.m. local time. I know, number two, I know. Then I go to the Excelsior Hotel and wait for Lomax to meet me and give me the microfilm. Right. Then you hide the film in your suitcase and get back to the airport for your 8 p.m. flight. Go on. At the airport, I mustn't talk to anyone. What happens if the customs search my bags? Make sure you hide the film well and they won't find it. And don't forget... You must be back here in this office with the film before midnight. What happens if I'm late? Don't be. The future of our country is in your hands. Good luck, number five. Now you will hear the piece again. Now, number five, let's talk about your trip once more. Your flight takes off at 10 a.m. and you arrive at 4 p.m. local time. I know, number two, I know. Then I go to the Excelsior Hotel and wait for Lomax to meet me and give me the microfilm. Right. Then you hide the film in your suitcase and get back to the airport for your 8 p.m. flight. Go on. At the airport, I mustn't talk to anyone. What happens if the customs search my bags? Make sure you hide the film well and they won't find it. And don't forget, you must be back here in this office with the film before midnight. What happens if I'm late? Don't be. The future of our country is in your hands. Good luck, number five. <laughs> Unit three, step one. Chat up lines. Better to slip with your tongue than with your feet. Chat up lines are used to break the ice. The first step in approaching someone you like. If the chat-up lines, or the answers to them, are witty, it might mean the beginning of a beautiful relationship. If they're not, you might end up with a black eye or a broken leg. When Adam asked Eve out, her answer was, I wouldn't go out with you even if you were the last person on earth. Eve didn't actually say that, of course. If she had said that, you and I wouldn't have been born. So... If I asked you to have dinner with me, would it be too much to ask for the sake of future generations? If future generations looked like you, I'd prefer to go hungry. I'd like to spend the rest of my life with you. OK. I don't have any plans for the next hour anyway. You're the icing on my cake, the cream in my coffee, the apple of my eye, the jam on my bread. How about dancing with me? No, thanks. I'm on a diet. You remind me of the ocean. You mean wild, restless and romantic? No, you make me sick. What would convince you that I am totally, 
hopelessly, uncontrollably, madly in love with you. A huge fat diamond, a fur coat, a yacht and a red sports car. If I gave you the chance to dance with the most charming, intelligent and attractive guy around here, what would you say? Too late. He left ten minutes ago. Unit 3, Step 2 If you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. Don't use the following smart remarks unless the person you are talking to has a good sense of humour. If I could, I'd put you somewhere for all the world to see. You would? Yes, in the Natural History Museum. I want a dreamboat, not a shipwreck. Does your mum know you're out this late? You look like a lost treasure. You mean precious and expensive? No, buried and forgotten. Your beauty is like a dream from which no one would wish to be awakened. So let me sleep. What's a girl like you doing in a nice place like this? I've never seen such a beautiful girl as you. But on the other hand, I've got rotten eyesight. You know, now the lights are low, you don't look as ugly as everyone says. Unit 3, Step 3. Teenage Advice Bureau. Crush. Dear TAB, I'm 17 years old and in my last year of school. This year we've been given a new maths teacher. He's in his early 30s and absolutely gorgeous. All the other girls think he's nice, but it's much more than that for me. It's not just that he's good looking. He's also clever, extremely kind, and always willing to help his students. I wish I didn't feel this way for him, but I can't help it. I've really fallen for him. The problem is that I wrote him a letter telling him how I felt, and now I wish I hadn't done it, but it's too late. If only I knew what to do. Can you give me any advice? A.C., Lovestruck. Dear Lovestruck, I wish I had a pound for every teenage crush I had when I was your age. I'd be a millionaire. Teenage crushes are part of growing up, but you mustn't let your feelings run away with you. You should look at it from his point of view. He would lose his job if he got involved with a student. And what about the age gap? between you and him. I wish you'd written to us before you sent the letter. However, don't worry about the letter. Just tell him it was written in the heat of the moment and tell him to ignore it. This is an important year at school for you and you must put your studies first. T.A.B. Unit 3, Step 4, Encyclopedia Corner. Dreams. Throughout history, dreams have played an important part in man's life. But it was not until the 19th century that psychologists Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung began to analyse dreams scientifically. However, even half a century ago, we still knew very little about dreams. We couldn't even say how much of our sleep was spent dreaming. This changed in the 1950s, when scientists started to unlock the closed door that hides almost a third of our lives. Some of their findings may surprise you. Did you know that little girls have dreams with happy endings, but boys do not? Children dream more than adults. People who were born blind do not see their dreams, but hear them. We cannot remember our dreams of a week ago because our brains do not store them in our long-term memory. People who remember their dreams are those who wake up many times during the night. Sleep on it. Psychiatrists believe that if you cannot find the answer to a problem, the solution may be to sleep on it. If the inventor 
Elias Howe had not had a particular dream, he might never have invented the modern sewing machine. When the New Scientist Journal gave its readers the sentence, I am not very happy acting pleased whenever, and asked them what was unusual about it, eleven students found the answer in their dreams. So, when you go to sleep tonight, see if you can find the answer to the New Scientist problem. Unit 3, Listening Comprehension. A visit to the doctor. You will hear a conversation between a doctor and his patient. Listen carefully and circle the correct answer to each question. You will hear the piece twice. Well, Mr. Porter, what's the problem? It's my wife, really, doctor. She thinks I eat and drink too much. You are a little heavy, Mr. Porter. Tell me, how much do you drink? Uh, about a bottle a day. That's not much. A bottle of beer a day? Uh, not beer, doctor. Whiskey. A bottle of whiskey a day? Good Lord, that's more than me. You have to give that up. Now, do you smoke? Uh, yes, a packet a day. Well, you have to stop that too. And no more fried potatoes, pizza, hamburgers or sweets. You should also get lots of exercise. Tell me, what sort of work do you do? I'm a football coach, Doctor. Oh! Now you will hear the conversation again. Well, Mr. Porter, what's the problem? It's my wife, really, Doctor. She thinks I eat and drink too much. You are a little heavy, Mr. Porter. Tell me, how much do you drink? Uh, about a bottle a day. That's not much. A bottle of beer a day? Uh, not beer, Doctor. Whiskey. A bottle of whiskey a day? Good Lord, that's more than me. You have to give that up. Now, do you smoke? Uh, yes, a packet a day. Well, you have to stop that, too. And no more fried potatoes, pizza, hamburgers or sweets. You should also get lots of exercise. Tell me, what sort of work do you do? I'm a football coach, Doctor. Oh! <laughs> Unit 4, Step 1. Miracles of Faith. Hook Hangers. Foreign visitors to religious festivals in Sri Lanka are often amazed by an incredible local custom people hanging from sharp metal hooks which are inserted into their flesh. Even harder to believe is that this custom, originally a way of asking for forgiveness, is bloodless and painless. It is believed by many people that this is a miracle of faith. They have such a strong belief in God that they feel no pain and do not bleed. Many doctors, however, disagree and say that there are simple reasons to explain it. They say that although a positive mental attitude is needed, where and how the hooks are placed is more important. Hook hangers do not bleed because the areas of skin where the hooks are inserted are first pinched. This prevents bleeding. Nowadays, not everyone practices hook hanging for religious reasons. Some hook hangers are professionals and are paid to perform for tourists. Unit 4, Step 2 Fire walking. Fire walking, walking barefoot on hot coals, has been performed regularly in villages in Asia, Africa, and even in some parts of Europe for many years. It was once believed that the ability to walk on fire was a supernatural power, a divine gift for leading a good life. Medical researchers, however, have shown that there is in fact a more scientific explanation for this phenomenon. When the feet of fire walkers were examined, they were found to have thick, hard soles 
from walking barefoot all their lives. And therefore, their feet could stand higher temperatures. In addition, it was noticed that firewalkers spent very little time, an average of three seconds, rushing across the coals. <laughs> Unit 4, Step 4 Astrological Signs A light-hearted look at your zodiac Aries, March the 21st to April the 20th Bold, energetic and tough Arians often have accidents Were you dropped on your head as a baby? Arians make good doctors and engineers Best job, plastic surgeon Taurus April the 21st to May the 20th. Patient, loyal and hard-working, which means you are given all the dirty jobs. Boys make good road sweepers. Girls' ideal job, assistance in frozen fish factories. Gemini, May the 21st to June the 20th. Ambitious, sensitive and intellectual. You expect too much for too little, when people say you have two sides to your character, they really mean you are two-faced. Whenever you're asked a tricky question, you lie like crazy. Both boys and girls make good politicians. Cancer. June the 21st to July the 20th. Sensitive, sympathetic and home-loving. You're always putting things off and you don't like risks. This makes you the dullest person in your circle of friends. All cancer people have moon faces. Since they like to help people, they make good doormen and excellent babysitters. Leo, July the 21st to August the 21st. Heroic, generous, kind-hearted and broad-minded. You consider yourself a born leader. You admire everything beautiful you see in the mirror. You are often given jobs beyond your abilities. You can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Because you love the arts, best career choice, theatre ticket seller. Virgo, August the 22nd to September the 22nd. Methodical, exact and critical. You love new clothes but have second-hand tastes. Virgo boys are rarely asked their opinions on important topics. Girls fall asleep as soon as they go to bed. Ideal job? Night watchman. Virgo boys make good bachelors. Unit 4, Step 5 Now you will hear a dialogue between two aliens, Bog and Smog. Hi Smog, back from Earth already? How did you get on? Well, it's nice to come back to civilization. Earth is a weird place, you know. I couldn't believe how ugly the people were. They've only got two eyes and they come in all different colours. Pink, brown, yellow. Not a nice pale green like us. Come on, really? It's true. We brought a pink one back to help the robot with the housework. You must come round and have a look at it. Great. I'll drop in later. Tell me, is it true they get around in little metal boxes on wheels? Oh yes! It's still pretty primitive there. When the sun comes up, they come out of the boxes they live in, get in their mobile boxes, and drive to a place they call the office. Office? What's that? It's a place they go to when they're tired, want to rest, and do nothing. What do they do for fun? Well, I came across a building called a stadium packed with people shouting at 22 men who are running after a spherical object. What do they do that for? I couldn't work it out. When they finally came to the object, they kicked it away again. What a strange place. I'd like to go, but we have to visit the wife's mother on Jupiter again this year. Unit 4 Step 6. Teenage Advice Bureau. I don't fit in. Dear TAB, 
Please can you give me some advice? I've just moved to a new school and no one likes me there. It's not because I'm unfriendly, it's just that I dress differently to everyone else and have completely different interests. They all seem to be into sports and TV soap operas and I dislike both. I love rock music and dress in that style. Everyone at my school shops in smart places and hates the stuff I like. They say it's time I changed and became like them. They seem to misunderstand me. I want to get on well with them, but I'm 16 and I think it's time I did what I want. What do you think? Should I try to fit in? MF, confused. Dear confused, a lot of people I know spent their school lives trying to fit in or feeling like an outsider. Let me put your mind at rest. There's no rule that says you have to dress the same way as everyone else. What a boring world it would be if we all looked and dressed alike. I think it's time you stopped worrying about what other people think. However, just because you have different tastes and interests does not mean you can't get on with other people. The way you dress is just one way of expressing your personality. It doesn't tell the world everything about you. Be friendly and open-minded and prove to your schoolmates that clothes do not make the man. T.A.B. Unit 4. Listening Comprehension. Stars. You will hear two friends talking about their horoscopes. Listen carefully and do the exercises. You will hear the piece twice. What star sign are you, Tony? I'll read your horoscope. I'm a Libra, the same as your sister. Right, let's see. Ah, there's so much going on around you this week that it will be hard for you to make important decisions. Wednesday is a good day for money matters, and on Friday you'll get a surprise letter. Be prepared for a wild weekend. A wild weekend? At my house? You must be joking. Read yours. OK, Scorpio. It's time you stopped worrying about the future and started to enjoy the present. You'll be asked a big favour by a friend later in the week and at the weekend there may be a party. Now you will hear the piece again. What star sign are you, Tony? I'll read your horoscope. I'm a Libra, the same as your sister. Right, let's see. Ah, there's so much going on around you this week that it will be hard for you to make important decisions. Wednesday is a good day for money matters, and on Friday you'll get a surprise letter. Be prepared for a wild weekend. A wild weekend? At my house? You must be joking. Read yours. OK, Scorpio. It's time you stopped worrying about the future and started to enjoy the present. You'll be asked a big favour by a friend later in the week, and at the weekend, there may be a party. Unit 5, Step 1. If I had a choice. In a recent survey, the magazine Careers Choice asked a group of people if they were satisfied with their jobs. Here's what they had to say. The best gift for society. As far back as I can remember, I'd always wanted to become a teacher. I started off ten years ago as a junior school teacher, soon to move up the scale and end up as a headmistress. I've been asked many times what I really think of my work, and I always say that I would never dream of anything else. I get an immense feeling of satisfaction and happiness from my work. Teaching never becomes a routine job. You are always dealing with children or young adults who listen to what you say, are interested in your opinions, carry on your ideas and absorb information like sponges. If I had a choice or had to change my present job, I'd become a teacher again even in a primary or nursery school. One should always bear in mind Cicero's wise words, 
that to teach and instruct young people is the best gift we can offer society. Like father, like son. I've worked for this company all my life. I followed in my father's footsteps. He had been working here for 40 years when he retired. My career has been very successful, and I should be satisfied with everything, but I'm not. Office life becomes a routine after a while. In a nine-to-five job, you look at the same faces and listen to the same old gossip day in, day out. When I was a young lad, I had always wanted to escape from the rat race and have my own farm. People in the city have lost touch with the real world. They hardly have time to communicate with each other. If I had my own farm, I would be self-employed and self-sufficient. I wouldn't have to rely on anyone else. I could also spend time on what I love most, growing things. Who knows, maybe one day I'll achieve my ambition. In the meantime, I can only dream of it. Unit 5, Step 2. The only breadwinner. I'm a taxi driver, so I'm self-employed. I'd been working for ten years as a truck driver when the company went broke and I had to find another line of work. It's nice to know that I'm my own boss and that I can't get fired. It has its drawbacks, however. I have a lot of family responsibilities. I've got four kids to support and I'm the only breadwinner so I have to work long hours to make ends meet. I really don't know what I would do if I had a choice. It's funny, all the people I meet every day, young or old, married or single, employed or unemployed, well off or broke, they all want something different. Maybe I'd like to do something really boring, like be a white collar worker and do a nine to five job. At least that way I'd see more of my family. Life's ups and downs. I've been in this business a long time, you know. By my next birthday, I'll have been acting for 35 years. And when I finish my present film, I'll have starred in more than 50 films. You'd be surprised at how many people think that an actress's life is all excitement and glamour. You can't succeed in this business unless you work like a horse. Luck helps too, of course. Before I got my first part in a film, I'd been working as a waitress for two years, until one day a studio director walked into the restaurant, and that was it. I've been very lucky in my career, and my private life too. I have my husband to thank for that. By next Christmas, we'll have been married for 30 years, which is a long time for this line of work. He has always helped me cope with life's ups and downs and has taught me to believe in myself. If I had a choice, I think I'd like to concentrate on theatre work instead of films. It's not so highly paid, but it's much more satisfying. Unit 5, Step 4 Letter from a Loon Dear son, I hope you have received this letter. We had a telephone put in last week, so if you don't get this, please phone and tell me. If nobody answers, just leave a message. Well, your Auntie Mary is staying with us at the moment because she's having her house painted. I think she's going dotty. She wanted to watch TV last night so she sat in front of the microwave for an hour and said the programs were boring. She then put the dishes in the washing machine and complained about the noise. She's driving us all up the wall. I paid a visit to the dentist this morning to have my teeth checked. The dentist put a tube in my mouth and told me not to talk for ten minutes. So your father offered to buy it from him. Speaking of your father, he's gone to have his hair cut. I've told him again and again it's a waste of money. It'll only grow again. Since it's his turn to have the key this week, I'm outside in the freezing cold waiting for him to come back. 
The central heating is on in the house, but I can't feel it. Why don't people put central heating outside where it's really needed? Your younger sister's washing machine is on the blink. She put in nine shirts, pulled the chain, and hasn't seen them since. Your brother is the same as ever. Yesterday he had a shower with his coat on because he said he didn't want to catch a cold. I think your grandmother should have her ears examined. When I asked her, How are you this morning? she said, Half past eleven. Anyway, That's all the news. Look after yourself. As I'm not sure of your address, I'll send this to myself so that when it arrives back here, I can keep it for you. Lots of love, Mum. P.S. Your older sister has just had twins, a boy and a girl. How does it feel to be an aunt and an uncle? <laughs> Unit 5, Step 5. Well done. Good morning, Mrs. Potato. Come in, come in. I won't bite you. Oh, Dr. Carrot, I tried to call you this morning, but I couldn't get through. I'm very worried about my test results. I still keep fainting, and everyone says I look as white as a sheet. Now, now, there's nothing to worry about. You'll be very happy to learn why you've been off colour lately. I will. Yes. It's perfectly natural in these cases. You mean I'm going to. Yes, it's definite. You're going to have chips. Hit and run. Can I help you, madam? Oh, thank heaven you stopped, officer. I had a flat tyre. I've managed to change the wheel, but I can't get the car back down. I'll see what I can do, madam. Thank you, officer. But please do it gently. Don't worry. How did it happen? I ran over a bottle of milk. How come you didn't see it? How could I, officer? The silly man had it in his pocket. Unit 5, Step 6. Teenage Advice Bureau. Fed up. Dear TAB, as a child, I was always my dad's favourite, as I'm the only girl in the family. These days, however, All we do is argue. He's so strict and has really old fashioned views. He's also always making comments about my appearance, saying things like, How much did you pay to have your hair done? It looks awful. At the moment, we're having our house redecorated, and he won't even let me have my room done the way I like it. Apart from that, he's also had the phone installed in his bedroom to stop me using it. I think he's trying to run my life. My mother says I'm being too defensive, but I don't agree with her. I just wish my father left me alone to lead my own life. R.H. Fed up. Dear Fed up, your father probably finds the fact that you are growing up difficult to face. I bet for years you looked up to him and did exactly what he said. But now you have a mind of your own. However, you shouldn't let things upset you so much. Many fathers feel overprotective towards their daughters. It's perfectly natural. Have a word with him and tell him that you would like a little more independence. But be tolerant and try to understand his point of view. He may not realize how fast his little girl is growing up. Just bear in mind that situations like this usually improve. TAB. Unit 5 Listening Comprehension. Explorer 27. You will hear a TV report about a trip to space. Listen carefully and circle the correct answer to each question. You will hear the report twice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Cape Canaveral, where the spacecraft Explorer 27 will be taking off in just under two minutes at 1700 hours. By 1500 hours this afternoon, scientists had examined and tested all computers and equipment. Shortly before we interviewed the crew leader, Captain Lovett, 
He had been speaking with the president, who had arrived earlier in the afternoon. Explorer 27 is expected to land on Mars on the 2nd of November. By that time, the crew will have been traveling for three weeks and will have sent back satellite pictures of Venus, Neptune and Mercury. Now you will hear the report again. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Cape Canaveral, where the spacecraft Explorer 27 will be taking off in just under two minutes at 1700 hours. By 1500 hours this afternoon, scientists had examined and tested all computers and equipment. Shortly before we interviewed the crew leader, Captain Lovett, he had been speaking with the President, who had arrived earlier in the afternoon. Explorer 27 is expected to land on Mars on the 2nd of November. By that time, the crew will have been traveling for three weeks and will have sent back satellite pictures of Venus, Neptune and Mercury. <laughs> Unit 6, Step 1. Mysteries. The Bermuda Triangle. For hundreds of years, strange things have been happening, and many ships, planes and lives have been lost in that part of the Atlantic known as the Bermuda Triangle. In March 1918, the U.S. Navy ship Cyclops vanished with 309 men on board, and the American naval authorities stated that no communication from the ship had been received. In the most famous mystery of all, five U.S. Navy planes disappeared without trace in 1945, and there were rumours that a rescued seaman said he had seen a weird airship which had captured the others. However, in his famous book on the subject, Lawrence Cush said, It's all nonsense. Some researchers agree with Kush. The Bermuda Triangle is an area in an extremely powerful magnetic field which affects ships and planes' instruments. There is a logical explanation for nearly all the disappearances. Until both sides agree, however, the Death Triangle continues to be a mystery. The Abominable Snowman Taller than a man, with a long cone-shaped head and covered with reddish-brown hair, the Yeti, or Abominable Snowman, has been spotted several times in the Himalayas. An Englishman living in Nepal said that he had seen an ape-like creature in the mountains, but people were not convinced. What he had seen, they said, was a monkey or a Himalayan red bear. The Indians of North America long ago told settlers that they had seen wild, hairy men in their mountains. Do these creatures exist, or are they the result of people's imagination? The Monkey Boy A tribe in Central Africa told of a boy brought up by a band of monkeys. They said that he walked on all fours and ate like a monkey. Understandable behaviour, but who can explain the fact that, when found at the age of four, he was covered in body hair? Unit 6, Step 2 UFOs Long before the Wright brothers flew their first aeroplane in 1903, thousands of people claimed they had seen mysterious flying objects and shining disks in the sky. In 1897, in the USA, tens of thousands of Americans saw a mysterious airship. They said it was flying across the country with lights flashing. During the Second World War, many UFOs were seen by pilots, but American security officers ordered the pilots not to say anything. Why were these incidents covered up? In Montana, a teenage boy claimed, I was sitting outside my home when a spaceship landed. A tall, green-eyed creature got out and dragged me into the ship and asked me a lot of questions. He later told the same story when hypnotized. 
A farmer in Brazil said that he was made to enter a flying saucer where he was examined by aliens. When Brazilian doctors examined the farmer, they found him to be in excellent physical and mental health. Do flying saucers exist? Ed Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon, commented, I am convinced some UFO sightings are real. The question is not whether UFOs exist or not, but what are they? Unit 6, Step 4 Who said it was all roses? The confusing, complicated world of teenagers. I'm 16 and don't know if I'm an adult or at what age I'll become one. I can get married now, but I can't vote. I wonder if a vote is more important or more dangerous than a husband. When I go to the cinema, I pay the same price as an adult, but they won't let me in to see adult films. I can also get a job selling alcohol, for example, but I'm not allowed to drink it. I'm a little bit confused. What exactly am I? A look at the generation gap. Parents are suspicious of teenagers who spend their school breaks reading psychology, who whistle happily before they take an exam, when they iron their own clothes, when they wear makeup at the beach, when they pass by a mirror without looking in it, when they never ask for pocket money. Teenagers get upset when they have to kiss old relatives, when they find spots on their faces, when parents return home as soon as the party begins, when mum waits on the doorstep after their first date. Unit 6, Step 5. Your money or your brains. Where on earth have you been? We're running out of time. Sorry, I couldn't help it. The car broke down, and while I was waiting for help, a lorry stopped, and this guy got out. He pulled out a gun and said, Give me all your money, or I'll blow your brains out. That's a good one. Didn't he know you have no brains? You know smartness runs in my family. Anyway, I told him to go ahead and shoot. No kidding. So how come you're still alive? He was so shocked that he ran away. Come off it. You told him to go ahead and blow your brains out and he ran away. You're either very brave or off your head. Well, you don't need brains to live in New York, but you can't get along without money. It's a miracle. Wake up, honey. It's a miracle. When I went to the bathroom just now, the light came on, even though I hadn't touched the switch. Then, when I finished, the light went out, all by itself. It's a miracle. It's a miracle, I tell you. It's not a miracle, Alf. You've just been to the fridge. Unit 6, Step 6. Teenage Advice Bureau. Falling out. Dear TAB, Recently, my best friend and I fell out. It was all my fault, because I was getting extremely jealous of her. The trouble is that she's very attractive and so popular that whenever we went out together, nobody took any notice of me. I lost my head and called her a show-off, which of course she isn't. It's three weeks since we quarrelled, and I really want to be friends again. I feel terrible. The last time I saw her was a week ago at a friend's birthday party. I wanted to speak to her, but she ignored me. I'm sorry about what I said, and I'm afraid she won't forgive me. What do you suggest? DM, Green with Envy. Dear Green with Envy, Jealousy is common in any relationship. Bear in mind, though, that whatever happens, your friend is still going to be popular, and you cannot stop that. It's been long enough since you last spoke. So the sooner you make up, the better. Explain your feelings to her. A good friend will forgive and forget. However, you must learn to ignore your feeling of jealousy. It is a negative emotion and does only harm. Try not to get upset. And remember that people would take notice of you too if you prove to them you have something to say. 
Don't live in your friend's shadow. Be yourself and show that you have a personality of your own. T-A-B. Unit 6. Listening Comprehension. A guest for dinner. You are going to hear a conversation between a husband and wife. Listen carefully and do the exercises. You will hear the piece twice. Beth, I'm home. George, where have you been? Dinner's almost ready and Aunt Mabel should be here any minute now. Oh, don't ask. I'm exhausted. Would you believe it took me more than an hour to get here? An hour? But it usually takes you only 15 minutes to get home. What happened? What didn't happen, you mean? It's Friday, there's a football match on at 8, the traffic lights were out of order, and there wasn't a policeman anywhere around. What's more, some silly old woman in a yellow Rolls Royce drove into the side of a taxi. That stopped traffic for an hour. What a mess. Oh, no. Did you say a yellow Rolls Royce? Yes. Why? George, Aunt Mabel drives a yellow Rolls Royce. Now you will hear the conversation again. Beth, I'm home. George, where have you been? Dinner's almost ready and Aunt Mabel should be here any minute now. Oh, don't ask. I'm exhausted. Would you believe it took me more than an hour to get here? An hour? But it usually takes you only 15 minutes to get home. What happened? What didn't happen, you mean? It's Friday, there's a football match on at 8, the traffic lights were out of order, and there wasn't a policeman anywhere around. What's more, some silly old woman in a yellow Rolls Royce drove into the side of a taxi. That stopped traffic for an hour. What a mess. Oh, no. Did you say a yellow Rolls Royce? Yes. Why? George, Aunt Mabel drives a yellow Rolls Royce. Unit 7, Step 1. Natural Wonders. Meteora. At Meteora, in the heart of northern Greece, 24 gigantic rocks rise from the ground. This area was once under the sea, but owing to a series of seismic movements, the seabed rose, pushing these and other rocks out of the water. In time, seawater eroded the other softer rock, leaving behind columns that have been called the Rocky Forest of Greece. The vertical lines on the rock are due to centuries and centuries of rain. Because of their height and isolation, these rocks were chosen by monks as an escape from the outside world. Today, however, only five of the original monasteries are still inhabited. The Grand Canyon The Grand Canyon, a vast, narrow passage along the Colorado River in northwest Arizona, is one of the most isolated parts of North America. People who visit the spectacular canyon say that it is like standing on the edge of the world. The canyon was formed as a result of erosion. Over the centuries, the river has worn down the sides of the canyon so that now we can see layers of rock that are 2,000 million years old. <laughs> Unit 7, Step 2 The Dead Sea The Dead Sea lying between Israel and Jordan, is the lowest point on the Earth's surface, at 396 metres below sea level. The Dead Sea also has the saltiest water in the world. It is eight times saltier than normal sea water. It is, in fact, not a sea at all, but a very large lake. It is called the Dead Sea because it is so salty that nothing, except for a few bacteria, can live in it. Because of all the salt in the water, it is impossible to sink or dive below the surface. Since it has many therapeutic powers, thousands of people who have health problems visit the Dead Sea every year. The Ross Ice Shelf 
The Ross Ice Shelf is the world's largest body of floating ice. This massive iceberg, about 800 kilometers long, fills an enormous bay on the frozen continent of Antarctica. Owing to pressure on the ice, very often huge blocks of ice break away and float out to sea. These smaller icebergs can be as long as 40 kilometers. As the top of the Ross Ice Shelf is so flat, it has been the starting point for many explorers in search of the South Pole. <coughs> Unit 7, Step 4. Sign language. Every picture tells a story. On Sunday morning, I was lying in bed, wondering what to do. Finally, I thought I'd better get up and go out to get some fresh air. Before I had gone too far, my eyes caught sight of something promising. When I saw her, my head began to spin. She smiled and said... Fancy a coffee at my place? At first I hesitated. I'd better go home, I thought, but there was no turning back. I had already fallen for her. I couldn't wait to tell her about my feelings. But she said she'd rather not rush things. Suddenly I heard a noise. Her mother had come home. I thought I'd better go. But there was no way out at the front and danger at the back. I knew I'd rather be bitten by a wild dog than face her mother. Unit 7, Step 5. The Stunt Man. Nosy Parker interviews Sam Stonehead. Professional stuntman. How did you come to be a stuntman? Pure accident, really. The studio was looking for a driver. I answered the ad. When I showed up, they said I was the image of Kevin Cool and asked me if I would be interested in doing some of his stunts. Tell us about a typical day on the set. Well, there's a lot of hanging around, of course, waiting for the camera crew. But when the cameras are rolling, it's very exciting. Diving out of windows beating up bad guys, jumping off roofs, breaking into houses... And breaking legs? I've never been seriously injured. A few cuts and grazes. But once I nearly got blown up. Really? What happened? I had to break out of a building ten seconds before it blew up. But I got the timing wrong. I got out of the building with two seconds to spare. It was close. I bet it was. Why do you do it? I like the thrill of it all, really. And being around big stars. Oh, yeah. And the money's good. Unit 7, Step 6. Teenage Advice Bureau. Parents. Dear TAB, I'm an only child who's getting on for 16 and consider myself very mature for my age. My problem is that my parents still treat me like a little child. I'm not allowed to go out after 8 o'clock and they don't let me phone my friends or let me wear the clothes I like. I know that my friends laugh at me behind my back because what I wear is so out of date. The situation is becoming terrible. Sometimes I feel like running away. Please tell me what you think I should do. L.H. Desperate. Dear Desperate, first of all, mature people don't run away from their problems. They face them. It is clear that your parents are very strict and overprotective. Maybe they don't let you go out because they don't know your friends. I think you should introduce your friends to your parents. If they are as mature as you, your parents will see that you would not be in bad company. I definitely think that you need some freedom, especially in what you wear. Explain to your parents that you don't want to be the odd one out at school, that you want to look and dress like everybody else. One thing is clear. 
the three of you should sit down together and talk about this. T.A.B. Unit 7. Listening Comprehension. Booking a Holiday. You are going to hear a conversation between Ian and Faye about a summer holiday. Listen carefully and do the exercises. You will hear the piece twice. Where are you spending your holiday this summer, Faye? Well, to tell you the truth, I haven't decided yet. Are you serious? April is almost over. You'd better hurry if you want to book a room. You're right, but where should I go? How about Mykonos? Do you remember how excited you were when you saw those photos in the brochure? Mykonos? That's a marvellous idea. But isn't it a bit far? What do you care? You've got plenty of time. Listen, I'll call that travel agency right now. Cosmos Tours, wasn't it? You'll be glad I did, believe me. I'm sure I will. Thanks. Now you will hear the dialogue again. Where are you spending your holiday this summer, Faye? Well, to tell you the truth, I haven't decided yet. Are you serious? April is almost over. You'd better hurry if you want to book a room. You're right, but where should I go? How about Mykonos? Do you remember how excited you were when you saw those photos in the brochure? Mykonos, that's a marvellous idea. But isn't it a bit far? What do you care? You've got plenty of time. Listen, I'll call that travel agency right now. Cosmos Tours, wasn't it? You'll be glad I did, believe me. I'm sure I will. Thanks. Part 3 Unit 8, Step 1 Home is where the heart is. There's no place like home. Having shelter has always been important for man. Early man sheltered wherever he could, from the cold, the burning sun or other bad weather conditions. Usually, the best shelter he could find was under trees or in caves. As time passed, people began building their own homes, using such materials as the branches of trees, stones and animal skins. Gradually, people developed building skills and began living together in villages and towns. They tried to make their homes comfortable as well as safe. People usually construct buildings from materials they can find easily. In Scandinavia and Canada, where there are large forests, many houses are made of wood. In extremely hot parts of the world, Mexico for example, dried mud is often used to build homes. Since there is little rain, the mud stays hard. Thick walls and small windows provide protection by keeping out the sun's strong rays. By looking at a house, we can tell a lot about the weather conditions in the country it is found in. In places where there is a lot of snow, such as Switzerland, houses are built with steep pointed roofs to prevent snow from settling on them and piling up. In countries with tropical climates, houses are built on stilts to keep them dry in the rainy season. Unit 8, Step 2 Eskimos, Eaters of Raw Meat Even the unfriendly frozen Arctic can provide shelter. When Eskimos, Eaters of Raw Meat, as they were named by North American Indians, are hunting away from home in winter, they build temporary shelters called igloos. These country houses are built from blocks of snow. Since water is so scarce in the deserts of Africa and Asia, 
nomads face the problem of finding water for their herds of animals. Moving from one place to another in search of water is a way of life for them. Their portable homes, tents, are easy to carry and put up. In overcrowded cities such as Hong Kong, where there is no more room for building, boats and houseboats provide homes for thousands of people. Houses of the future. Many modern architects have already designed and built energy saving houses. In the future, people may live in houses which rely on wind power for generating electricity and solar energy for heating. Unit 8, Step 3 History Test. Lee, I'll never get through the history exam tomorrow. There's too much to take in and my mind's gone blank. Take it easy, Roy. Here, hand me your book and I'll test you. Now, let's see. When did the First World War break out? Um, just a second. 1915? Wrong, 1914. Next question. Who took over from J.F. Kennedy as President of the USA? Oh, it's on the tip of my tongue. I remember. Nixon? Wrong. Lyndon Johnson. Next. When was the United Nations organisation set up? Let me see. No, it's gone. I give up. 1945. Last question. I'm getting fed up with this. What nationality was Alexander the Great? That's a piece of cake. Russian. That does it, Roy. He was Greek, you dodo. I'm off to the park. You'd better go through this book again. Good luck. You'll need it. What am I going to do? Unit 8, Step 4. Photography plus radio equals TV. Ever since the marriage of photography to radio, people have been divided into two different categories, the believers and the non-believers. The believers think that TV is not only entertaining, but educational as well, and will not allow anyone in the room to speak a word while it is on, in case they miss something vital. The non-believers think that TV is chewing gum for the eyes, plastic entertainment of little taste or worth. Advertising. I must confess that I like TV. I'm especially keen on advertising and always look forward to watching the weather forecast. Some critics of advertising say that it is the art of making whole lies out of half-truths. Others say that it is the art of telling lies legally. I believe, however, that advertising is a necessary evil. Doing business without advertising is like winking at a girl in the dark. You know what you're doing, but nobody else does. Advertisers try to keep the public happy by providing what they promise. Here's an excellent example. On an advertising game show, Win a Million, a woman won a 15-day holiday and one million dollars. On hearing this, the poor woman dropped dead from the shock. The advertising company who ran the show kept their word. They sent the body to the Bahamas for two weeks. The weather forecast. If advertising fills your brain with nonsense, the weather forecast makes a refreshing change. Surprisingly, it also keeps your brain working by giving you puzzles to work out. What difference is there, for example, between sunny periods with occasional showers and showery periods with occasional sunshine. Another puzzle is why those weathermen keep smiling, even when they are busy telling us about floods and storms. Like it or not, TV is here to stay. And without it, would there be anything worth talking about at dinner parties? Unit 8 Listening Comprehension Letter to a Friend You will hear someone reading her letter to a friend. Listen carefully and tick 
Only the four statements you hear spoken. You will hear the letter twice. Dear Kate, just a note to thank you for your letter before Easter. I'm really sorry I didn't write sooner, but you know how it is. It was such a shame you couldn't come. We had a lot of fun here, but of course it wasn't the same without you. The funniest thing happened on Easter Sunday. My uncle George had too much to drink, as usual, and sat on the Easter cake Aunt Penny had brought. Anyway, the real reason I'm writing is because I've got a great idea. Uncle George and Aunt Penny invited me to their place during the summer holidays. They have a horse farm in Scotland. I'd love to go, but I don't want to go on my own. Why don't you come with me? Please don't let me down. We'll have a great time. Just imagine we can go riding every day or do whatever we like for two whole weeks. Drop me a line and let me know your answer. I can't wait to see you. Lots of love, Sonia. Now you will hear the piece again. Dear Kate, just a note to thank you for your letter before Easter. I'm really sorry I didn't write sooner, but you know how it is. It was such a shame you couldn't come. We had a lot of fun here, but of course it wasn't the same without you. The funniest thing happened on Easter Sunday. My uncle George had too much to drink, as usual, and sat on the Easter cake Aunt Penny had brought. Anyway, the real reason I'm writing is because I've got a great idea. Uncle George and Aunt Penny invited me to their place during the summer holidays. They have a horse farm in Scotland. I'd love to go, but I don't want to go on my own. Why don't you come with me? Please don't let me down. We'll have a great time. Just imagine, we can go riding every day or do whatever we like for two whole weeks. Drop me a line and let me know your answer. I can't wait to see you. Lots of love, Sonia. Unit nine, step one. Teenagers, bridge the gap. Welcome to WRBFM. Today on Bridge the Gap, Paul Proby talked to a group of teenagers about how their elders see them. And how they see themselves. Do you think that teenagers are only interested in discos and fun? Well, a teenager's life is just as much a challenge and a struggle as an adult's. We need a way of letting off steam, whether it's a disco or a basketball game. We need a change from the serious things in life. Look at the world we've been brought up in: wars, famine, violence, drugs. Of course, we want to have fun. That's only natural. Of course, I go to the disco at weekends. On weekdays, I stay up till all hours studying. I need to have some fun now and then. What about teenagers' relationships with their parents? Does the generation gap really exist? It's true that a lot of young people have problems with their parents. It's because parents don't find time to spend with their kids and don't know what's going on in their lives. Even worse. Some parents just aren't interested. How important are friends to you? I couldn't do without my friends. It's important to have someone to share your thoughts with, and to turn to when things get you down. Grown-ups often blame you for everything that goes wrong. What do you say about that? Give us a break. I'm fed up with their criticism. Why don't adults take a good look at themselves before they turn on us? <laughs> Unit nine, step two. Selfish creatures. Some more points of view. I get on very well with my parents. We have a great relationship, and we always talk our problems over. My parents expect too much of me. I know they want me to do well at school, and although I do my best, it's hard to keep it up. Teenagers today have too much. They've turned into selfish creatures who don't care about others. And rarely look up to their elders. Things were different in my day. I've got two kids who accuse me of treating them like babies. That's because I worry terribly about them all the time. After all, they're growing up in a difficult and dangerous world, aren't they? 
I strongly believe that young people love life and want to enjoy every minute of it. But life for them means more than just fun. It means challenge and struggle, love and ambition. It is ideals and faith, responsibility and hope. And hope, of all things, is the last thing to die. Unit 9, Step 3. Fix it, George. George? George! I'm talking to you. Turn down that radio. What is it, dear? It's the washing machine, George. It's making funny noises again. I'll see to it tomorrow, dear. And the tap in the bathroom's leaking. I thought you rang the plumber up about that. I did, but he never turned up. I'll give him a piece of my mind when I see him. This house is driving me up the wall, George. It's in a terrible state. We have to have the bedrooms painted, the doors mended and the roof fixed. We have to have the whole house done up, George. Yes, dear. Now don't worry, I'll fix it all tomorrow. Tomorrow? You're always putting things off till tomorrow. Oh, by the way, the TV's on the blink too. I turned it on this morning and nothing happened. What? There's a match on tonight. I'll see to it right away. Unit 9, Step 4. Dinosaurs. We have been taught to think that dinosaurs were huge, green, meat-eating monsters with little intelligence that spent their time in prehistoric jungles looking for food and trouble. Recent scientific discoveries, however, fossils, dinosaurs' nests, eggs and footprints, have given us a completely different picture. Not all dinosaurs were enormous. One species, the Mononychus, one claw, was the size of a turkey and looked like a modern flightless bird. Instead of a dull green, many may have been brightly coloured with stripes and spots. They probably travelled in groups and migrated every year. The evidence of nests suggests that they cared for their young and may have cooperated with one another to protect them. Most scientists believe that all dinosaurs died out about 65 million years ago. The cause might have been a huge comet or asteroid which struck the Earth and dramatically changed the climate worldwide. Some scientists say, however, that at least one line of dinosaurs could have survived and is still around today, birds. Unit 9. Listening Comprehension. A newspaper ad. You'll hear a conversation between a couple discussing a newspaper advertisement. Listen carefully and tick the items that are for sale. You will hear the dialogue twice. Jason, there's an ad in today's paper for a house sale. An American family is leaving the country and they've got to sell everything right away. We might find some good bargains. Hmm, sounds good. What have they got? Let's see. Furniture. Lots of furniture. Complete bedroom set with double bed, matching night tables and chest of drawers, mirror, antique wardrobe. We could use the bed. How about sitting room furniture? That old sofa of ours is worn out. I don't see a sofa here. Just a couple of armchairs and a coffee table. Bookcase, TV stand. Oh, they've got a kitchen table and four chairs. Just what we need. And listen to the appliances. Cooker, blender, mixer, toaster, coffee maker. How about something electronic, like a personal computer? I'm afraid not. Just a pocket calculator and a portable cassette recorder. Well, let's telephone them and see what they say. Now you will hear the piece again. Jason, there's an ad in today's paper for a house sale. An American family is leaving the country and they've got to sell everything right away. We might find some good bargains. Hmm, sounds good. What have they got? Let's see. Furniture, lots of furniture. Complete bedroom set with double bed, 
matching night tables and chest of drawers, mirror, antique wardrobe. We could use the bed. How about sitting room furniture? That old sofa of ours is worn out. I don't see a sofa here. Just a couple of armchairs and a coffee table. Bookcase, TV stand. Oh, they've got a kitchen table and four chairs. Just what we need. And listen to the appliances. Cooker, blender, mixer, toaster, coffee maker. How about something electronic, like a personal computer? I'm afraid not. Just a pocket calculator and a portable cassette recorder. Well, let's telephone them and see what they say. Now you will hear the piece again. Jason, there's an ad in today's paper for a house sale. An American family is leaving the country, and they've got to sell everything right away. We might find some good bargains. Hmm, sounds good. What have they got? Let's see. Furniture. Lots of furniture. Complete bedroom set with double bed, matching night tables and chest of drawers, mirror, antique wardrobe. We could use the bed. How about sitting room furniture? That old sofa of ours is worn out. I don't see a sofa here. Just a couple of armchairs and a coffee table. Bookcase, TV stand. Oh, they've got a kitchen table and four chairs. Just what we need. And listen to the appliances. Cooker, blender, mixer, toaster, coffee maker. How about something electronic, like a personal computer? I'm afraid not. Just a pocket calculator and a portable cassette recorder. Well, let's telephone them and see what they say. Now you will hear the piece again. Jason, there's an ad in today's paper for a house sale. An American family is leaving the country, and they've got to sell everything right away. We might find some good bargains. Hmm, sounds good. What have they got? Let's see. Furniture, lots of furniture. Complete bedroom set with double bed, matching night tables and chest of drawers. Mirror, antique wardrobe. We could use the bed. How about sitting room furniture? That old sofa of ours is worn out. I don't see a sofa here. Just a couple of armchairs and a coffee table. Bookcase, TV stand. Oh, they've got a kitchen table and four chairs. Just what we need. And listen to the appliances: cooker, blender, mixer, toaster, coffee maker. <laughs> Unit Ten, Step One, Computers. Thinking machines. Whether we like it or not, computers are now a part of modern life. Weather forecasting, putting satellites into space, and safe air travel are things we take for granted, but they would be impossible without computers. By giving the right information and instructions to it. A computer can be used for many things: filing letters, working out salaries, designing buildings and cars. Although a computer cannot yet think for itself, it works like an electronic brain that can do extremely difficult tasks in a very short time. A mixed blessing. The government of Thailand recently won a prize for being a hero of the information age. They are working on a system which, by the year 2006, will have detailed information on 65 million citizens. Every citizen will have to carry a card with a color photo, personal information, and an identification number. This system will make life easier for both Thai people and government offices, but it is a mixed blessing. It means that government officials and the police, by using the ID number, can find out almost anything they want to know about anybody. Using computers for this purpose would be illegal in most Western countries. The question is, has technology gone too far? Unit Ten, Step Two. At your command. The dream of directing computers by using spoken commands will soon become reality at work and at home. Everyone has seen films in which space travelers chat to their computers, 
and the computers answer back. Such technology, a computer able to say please and thank you in the right place, is no longer a miracle of science. Recognizing the words that make up normal, continuous human speech, however, is another matter. Today, computer industry giants are concentrating on programming computers to react to spoken commands. As Jean Kovacs speaks through the microphone, her machine listens and acts on her commands. The computer can respond to any of 200 commands, but does not always understand what Kovacs says. When this happens, a cartoon-like character appears on the screen and scratches his head. Kovacs then repeats her command more clearly. When the telephone rings, she tells Simon not to listen to avoid causing confusion in the computer. These voice command systems help companies greatly by saving huge amounts of time and, of course, money. Unit 10, Step 3. Business is business. I want a word with you, young man, before you put that TV on. Your time is up. Have you reached a decision? You can't keep on like this, you know. A decision, Dad? About what? About your future, my boy. You can't put it off any longer. Oh, Dad, do we have to talk about this now? Yes, we do. I've made up my mind. I want you to come and work with me as a junior partner. But, Dad, I don't know anything about the business. You'll pick it up. Now, which department do you want to start in? Well, I'd better be honest. I don't fancy the idea of working in the shipping room, and I couldn't put up with the people in the accounts department. Hold on. You have to start somewhere. What would you really like most? Well, Dad, let me put it like this. As I'll be a full partner one day anyway, can't you buy me out now? Unit 10, Step 4. Private Eye, Cutting Humour. The following short passages appeared in various English language publications. Motorists were reported to be stuck in a five-mile traffic jam yesterday after a glue tanker overturned on the A355 at Slough. Daily Telegraph. Nick Shaw with his wife Louise after their home had been wrecked by a gas explosion. The Times. England soccer captain Brian Robson was banned from driving for three years after admitting a drink-driving offence. He was standing by his car, which had run out of petrol, and Mr Robson smelled strongly of petrol. It seemed he had been drinking. Yorkshire Post. After trying to strangle his wife in their Ilchester home, Brian John Masters called the police and asked for help. Yeovil and District Western Gazette. The Goat Grill. We serve the best beef in Dublin. Advertisement in a Dublin newspaper. It was reported yesterday that three boys escaped when a wall collapsed at the Zoological Gardens, Regent's Park, London. The Times. Harewood Christian Discussion Group. We shall be meeting on Wednesday 11th of April when the subject will be Heaven, how do we get there? Transport is available at 7.55pm from the bus stop opposite the Harewood Arms. Collingham Parish Magazine. Learn to drive. Daily, weekly and weekend. Crash courses available. Telephone 229 6871. Edinburgh Herald and Post. <laughs> Unit 10. Listening Comprehension. Tour of Cairo. You are going to hear a tourist guide explaining a day's programme to a group of tourists. Listen carefully and number the activities in the order in which you hear them. You will hear the piece twice. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please gather round and listen carefully. 
This is the programme for our tour of Cairo tomorrow. After a continental breakfast at the hotel, our bus leaves at exactly 9am for Giza. So please be ready and waiting at the hotel entrance. At Giza, we'll see the Great Pyramids first, and then the Sphinx. At 11am, we'll take a half-hour break for refreshments, and if there's time, you'll be able to take pictures and have a camel ride. Our bus leaves for Cairo at noon, and we return to the hotel for lunch. After lunch, we visit the Cairo Museum, where we'll see the mummies and treasures from the tombs of the pharaohs. Remember, no pictures, please. Next on our programme is a shopping tour of Cairo, and we'll be going on foot to the bazaar. You'll be free to walk around the shops until five, when we meet at the King Tut Cafe for tea. Back then to the hotel, and your evening is free. Is that clear now? Any questions? Now you will hear the programme again. All right, ladies and gentlemen, please gather round and listen carefully. This is the programme for our tour of Cairo tomorrow. After a continental breakfast at the hotel, our bus leaves at exactly 9am for Giza, so please be ready and waiting at the hotel entrance. At Giza, we'll see the Great Pyramids first, and then the Sphinx. At 11am, we'll take a half-hour break for refreshments, and if there's time, you'll be able to take pictures and have a camel ride. Our bus leaves for Cairo at noon, and we return to the hotel for lunch. After lunch, we visit the Cairo Museum, where we'll see the mummies and treasures from the tombs of the pharaohs. Remember, no pictures, please. Next on our programme is a shopping tour of Cairo, and we'll be going on foot to the bazaar. You'll be free to walk around the shops until five, when we meet at the King Tut Cafe for tea. Back then to the hotel, and your evening is free. Is that clear now? Any questions? Unit 11, Step 1. The Front Door to Greece. The Face of Greece. Located at the crossroads of East and West, linking the Aegean with the Black Sea and Europe with Asia, Thrace has, since earliest times, played an important role in the development and spread of Hellenic ideals and culture. The population of Thrace, Herodotus tells us, is greater than any other country in the world except India. The Greek colonies of Thrace, flourishing centres of trade, gave birth to Democritus and Protagoras and were home to poets and artists from all over the Hellenised East. With the spread of Christianity and the foundation of Byzantium, the focus of Hellenism was transferred from central and southern Greece to Thrace, which became the forecourt of Constantinople. The Forgotten Frontier the situation in Thrace today is entirely different. Visited by few and forgotten by many, Greece's window on the east, like an ailing business, will put up its shutters on an empty shop if it continues to be the victim of government neglect and indifference. While other areas of the country have benefited from continued and often unnecessary economic aid, Thrace has been consistently ignored. For Thracians, this is a heavy burden to bear. Over the past few decades, thousands of inhabitants have had to leave their homes and emigrate to other parts of the country and the world in search of employment. Is the forecourt of Byzantium soon to become the backyard of the Balkans? <laughs> Unit 11, Step 2. Greece does not end in Thrace. It begins there. While the situation is serious, it is not hopeless. There is much that can be done as long as the government and the people of Greece are prepared to do it. Greece could give new life to Thrace, first of all by encouraging people to live and work there. This simply means providing the jobs and facilities schools, universities, hospitals, factories, as well as research institutions needed by any community. 
After all, construction costs no more here than anywhere else in Greece, and Thrace would provide an attractive alternative to overcrowded areas. It is just as important to make people aware of Thrace's history and culture. Schools should place emphasis on Thrace, showing students the many parts of this province. Why not introduce schoolchildren to the beautiful cities and villages of this region, rather than the usual overcrowded and overpriced seaside resorts in the rest of the country? Promoting tourism would help too. Thrace has much to offer the visitor, not only museums and archaeological sites, but also unspoiled beaches, rivers, lakes, forests, nature reserves, and above all. A warm and welcoming people. Time is important to Thrace. Our time. Take time for its fascinating history, its countless treasures, its rich culture. Take time to explore its villages and cities. Take time to know Thrace as much a part of our Greek heritage as the Acropolis. Enjoy all that Thrace has to offer and help it prosper. Take time to make Thracian friends. Through their warm-hearted hospitality and friendship, you'll find a new source of happiness. Delve into the Thracian soul, and you'll discover in yourself a new source of strength. Unit Eleven, Step Three: A Brief Phone Call. Hello. Hello, Jeremy. It's Alf. How are things? Hi, Alf.、Uh, can you do me a favour and call back later? I'm really busy right now. This is a matter of life and death, Jeremy. I had a terrible dream last night. I... Alf, I have a plane to catch in an hour, and I have to be off right away. I'll be brief then. Last night I dreamed I passed away. When I got to heaven, Saint Peter let me in. He told me that if I had never cheated on my wife, I could have a Rolls Royce and drive around heaven forever. But he said that if I had cheated on her once, I could only have a Mercedes, twice a Mini, three times a motorbike, and so on. Hold on, Alf. You've never been out with another woman, have you? Of course not, and I never would. And that's what I told Saint Peter. So he handed me the keys to a brand new Rolls Royce. Oh, what's so bad about that? What did you expect, a jet? I haven't finished yet. Well, I was speeding in my new Rolls when a traffic policeman told me to pull over. Get to the point, Alf. I haven't got all day. Well, just then my wife came along. Oh, I see. Even dead, you couldn't get rid of her. It's worse than that, Jeremy. She was riding a bicycle with two flat tires. Oh, I see. <laughs> And your wife was pushing it. 